Lawyers, what's a case you regretted winning? Family law is a little different in that you never really win, per se. You may get more favorable rulings or better terms, but unless the opposing party did something illegal or mind-bogglingly stupid, it's never a decisive win, really. Although I did have a case where my client fought really hard for the dog and then ended up turning him over to a shelter. Frickin' jerk. The ex-wife received an anonymous tip and was able to get him back quickly. Assuming that anonymous tip means that OP did it, that's pretty sick. We now have a Discord. Check out the server in the link in the description. Story 2. Did a divorce where the husband, who I was representing, wanted to trade custody of his children for a set of bedroom furniture. The bedroom furniture was not even like a family heirloom. It was furniture that you could probably get at a rooms to go or something. Ugh, still makes me sick. That's why I got out of family law. Story 3. I do juvenile work, criminal law and family law. I represented this client first when he was a juvenile charged with disorderly conduct at school and fighting. Then when he became an adult, it was for simple things like possession of marijuana. As he got older, it became easier and easier to figure out what part of his life hasn't gone well as it could. And I tried to console him and push him to better himself. He got his GED, he started going to NA, he started classes at a community college and found a part-time job. On the night of his 21st birthday, he was charged with a DUI. Of course, I'll take care of that too. About six months later, we are due in court for trial on a Monday and he doesn't show up, which at this point in his life is highly unusual. As I'm trying to figure out where he is, the court starts going over arraignments slash first appearances, and then, lo and behold, three people are up for murder charges. The prosecution starts to tell the judge what the facts slash circumstances of the case are, and mentions a few victims' names. Apparently, my client was at a party when these three individuals decided to allegedly do a drive-by shooting. My client suffered multiple gunshot wounds and didn't make it to the hospital. So, by default, as you can't prosecute a dead person, the state has to take a dismissal. I guess technically a win. Either way, it was crushing to me as I thought he had really turned his life around. It, he had. Story 4. Woman wanted the custody of her daughter. We used the state preference about custody going to the mother, judge bias, her improved economical situation, and some minor garbage like her grades and discipline problems at school to discredit the dad. Not even a month after we won, the mother calls and she says she has a problem. Then she explains that the problem was her boyfriend assaulted the girl and had the gall to ask we pick up his defense. One of the things that made me quit to government work. Story 5. Was representing the government at a social benefits tribunal. The applicant was an autistic man who was struggling to make ends meet but was trying his absolute best to contribute everything he could to society. He had a job where his manager was very accommodating and was a very sympathetic person. He just wanted the extra cash to make his life a little easier. Sadly, he didn't qualify for the benefit but I think he deserved it. My closing argument was that no matter how much we empathized with this man, no matter how deserving we thought he was, he simply, he simply didn't qualify and the tribunal had to apply the law. He was unsuccessful and when I left the building to head back to my office, he was just sitting outside on the curb, crying. That image has stuck with me for a few years. Pretty heartbreaking. Edit. For those of you that are sending me words of support, thank you. That was the lowest point in my career and I've moved on. It's really important to remember that mental health in the legal profession is a very real issue that is unaliving people. There aren't sufficient supports in place to help people like me and many others who find themselves in positions like these. For those of you telling me I'm a horrible person, you literally can't say anything that will make me feel worse about this, so please just have some compassion. I work elsewhere and provide a much-needed service to my country and my community. I also donate to a mental health charity on a monthly basis. What are you doing to fight unfair systems? Also, in case you aren't aware, social benefits are a finite resource. Often the criteria for qualification are strict. Not everyone can receive it, otherwise there wouldn't be enough to go around. This particular system I was working in was a needs-based system. Those with the most severe disabilities met the criteria, and I often advocated on their behalf despite the government's initial position if I felt they met the criteria. Yeah, that's rough, because even if you think the person deserves it, then you can't. You just risk your own job, and you have to make someone else's day real bad, or maybe even their life. That's a brutal position to be in, and I don't envy that part of being a lawyer whatsoever. Story 6. There was a case that I saw that involved a claim with fee shifting, meaning that if the plaintiff won, their attorney's fees would get paid by the defendant. Defendant pushed an aggressive legal position at trial that the judge agreed with and won, avoiding a few thousand in liability to the plaintiff and a few thousand in attorney's fees. So far, so good. But then the plaintiff appeals all the way to the state's high court requiring a ton of briefing and time. High court agrees with the plaintiff, reverses and sends back to the trial court which now enters judgment against the defendant for a few thousand in damages against the plaintiff and tens and tens of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees from the appeal. 
the defense lawyer probably regretted winning at first on that aggressive argument to the trial court. Story 7. In one of my first cases after passing the bar, a young man retained me on a drunk driving charge. No one was hurt, but he totaled his car. During the trial, the arresting police officer testified that my client was clearly drunk at the accident scene, and that my client was loudly blaming the accident on the frickin' jerk who stole his car, saying he crashed it and then fled before the cops arrived. However, according to two other witness statements tendered into evidence, it was my client's friend, the passenger, who was screaming about the jerk who stole the car, not my client, the driver. The cop must have confused the two men during his testimony. This discrepancy raised a reasonable doubt in the judge's mind, so she acquitted my client. At the time, the acquittal was somewhat unexpected for me. In my personal view, my client was clearly drunk and responsible for the accident, regardless of who was blaming the mystery jerk to the cops. But I was happy my young client got off, no one was hurt, and lessons were learned. And I was quite euphoric to have won my very first criminal case. The regret? About a month after the acquittal, my young client called me at 3am from the police station saying, Hey, it's me again. The police arrested me for drunk driving again. Can you help me? Not only did I answer, no, I instantly regretted getting the earlier acquittal. My client apparently didn't learn anything. Story 8. Had this happened to me twice. Got my client out on bail only to thereafter have him up and unalived. First time, he was in a building supposedly selling. Got chased by the police and a struggle ensued where he was shot point blank in the head. Mother told me that it was my fault that he was killed and that I was working with the DA and the police. Second time, a young man no more than 16 gets released while waiting trial on robbery. One of the conditions of release was that he maintain a curfew. That very night, he breaks curfew to go over to somebody else's house and was unalived in a drug-related robbery. Mother blamed me and said that the devil was working through me and that we were all demons. Criminal defense is a hard business. Story 9. I did some custody work early in my career and won some cases more on the merit of my trial skills than on the merit of the parents. The thing with family law work in general is that there is essentially no bar to entry. Anyone with a law degree and a pulse can get a family law practice up and running quickly, because there's just an absolute glut of work. What that also means is that 75 plus percent of lawyers practicing family law are clueless and awful. Early in my career, I was certainly clueless, but at the very least, I wasn't awful. Therefore, in a battle between clueless plus awful versus just clueless, clueless usually won. So yeah, I can't recall any specific cases except to say that fighting over children in court is a terrible thing. And basically everyone loses. I regret that entire portion of my career. Story 10. I wouldn't say I regret this so much as to this day it amazes me. As a first year associate I was given a terrible PI case where my client received a flu shot and therefore felt pain in his shoulder. He then went to another doctor who performed an MRI and determined he had a torn rotator cuff, which was undoubtedly not related. My job was to allege the flu shot caused the rotator cuff tear. Our ortho actually correlated the two, which is the more regrettable position, and the case paid out. Being the bottom of the totem pole, I had no choice but to take the case, which was handed down by a partner, but at the same time just overwhelmingly made me feel like the worst stereotyped attorney and just hated having to walk into court on it, because it felt like my reputation was just being destroyed. Story 11. I work in medical malpractice defense. Once I had an obstetrician slash gynecologist who burned a patient during a procedure. When I met with the doctor, he lied to me throughout the representation over 16 months, saying he had no idea how it happened. There is a doctrine in law called res ipsa, meaning absent of some sort of negligence, this accident could not have occurred. Woman came in without a burn, and after the procedure, the woman left with a burn. There is no way this doctor didn't know what had happened. The area of the burn was where he was operating on. It wasn't until I brought up settlement, because this was not a case we could win, did he say, Oh, maybe I do know what happened. We ultimately settled the case, which is considered a favorable outcome considering the potential high monetary verdict. Sometimes I think this doctor really ought to have lost that case and their license. Story 12. I'm a work comp attorney. Now represent injured people, but used to work on the other side insurance defense. There was an applicant with a serious injury, fell off a ladder, busted back with fusion, shoulder screwed up, years of treatment, internal issues, psych issues, just really screwed up. 50% plus permanent disability. We were five years in and finally getting to settlement time. If we bought out his future medical, settlement pretty far into six figures. This guy was the sole provider for a wife and two kids. Then we found out he had an aggressive brain cancer, expected only to live a couple of years at best. Thus, we wouldn't buy out future medical anymore. Still got permanent disability for 60000 ish 
but can't give medical buyout based on 25 plus year life expectancy anymore. I felt terrible for the guy and his family. Me and the adjuster tried to get the insurance to agree to some sort of amount like a 5 year buyout, but the bean counters said hell no. The attorney knew it wasn't me making the decision. Even though he worked on that guy's file for 5 plus years, he decided to take zero dollars in fees. I have so much respect for that attorney turning down almost $10,000 in fees, just to help his client in a crappy situation. Yeah, insurance companies really are just the closest we get to the devil, huh? Story 13. I do family law and I represented a father who had lost most of his custody from drug use and imprisonment as a result. He came to me saying he was clean and doing good and had his life together and it checked out. He had been clean for almost nine months, not counting jail time, and seemed sincere in wanting to resume a full relationship with his son. The other side fought viciously to keep him at extremely little custody and supervised at that but we prevailed and got an order restoring fairly frequent unsupervised partial custody. Not long afterwards, only about three months after the case, he was back on the drugs, sold most of his furniture, and for me, the most soul-crushing is that he set up a fake GoFundMe for his child's cancer. His child didn't have cancer and has never had cancer, so you know where that money was going. I withdrew my appearance at this point, so I don't know what happened afterwards, but I imagine and hope his custody was taken away. Basically, the net result of winning that case was that the poor boy had to witness his father relapse and was exploited for money. Worst case I ever won. Story 14. After law school, I had to turn down a criminal defense job offer because my wife got a better offer somewhere else. So basically, I followed her along and was desperate to find something. After three months of fruitless efforts, I would take just about any job that required a JD, whereas literally the only thing I ever wanted to do was criminal defense. Three months after moving, I got an interview for a real estate litigation job. They hired me the next day. Looking back, that was probably red flag number one. First day on the job, they taught me how to foreclose on a claim of lien. These are two things I had never heard of before. Turns out it is totally brainless work if you have the right forms. Mind-numbingly boring, basically just cutting and pasting new addresses and amounts owed. So anyway, it took me about two months to realize this, when I had my first set of hearings, but literally my sole purpose at the firm, which represented over 100 homeowner associations, was to take people's houses away for not paying their homeowners association dues. After my first set of foreclosures, I actually slipped into a pretty legitimate depression. I was getting paid peanuts to drive nearly an hour to work every day to do work I despised on behalf of people I literally could not pretend to care about. The straw that broke the camel's back was when I started signing the foreclosures and realized I was that guy. You know, I understand someone has to do the work, I guess. There's certainly a lot of money to be made, but it's not for me. I did that job for three months. I did that job for three months. Came home one Friday and told my wife I'd rather be homeless than come back on Monday. By some stroke of luck, I started a stellar criminal defense job within two weeks and all of the heartache has 100% been worth it. I've won a lot of cases. You have to redefine winning and losing when doing criminal defense because sometimes even a particularly juicy plea is a win and never once felt bad about it. For example, I got a guy's plea deal cut from 60 years to 15 years for a string of robberies, where the interrogations and confessions were overwhelmingly unconstitutional. Like, the interrogations were textbook how not to do an interrogation, Missouri vs. Seibert, and stuff like that. Never lost sleep over someone not going to jail. So yeah, every case where I took someone's house away, probably two dozen times for not paying HOA fees, generally $4,000 or less, was the worst case I ever won. Screw HOAs. Story 15. In the spring of 2018, I was a third year practicing intern at a public defender's office. As the job entailed, I dealt with a lot of clients who were facing time, but none really blew my mind more than the following. Sometime in that spring, I got up every morning as usual, drove to the office located in a building with the courthouse, and picked up the files for the supervising attorney. I did this because I liked having the exposure with the other attorneys, whether prosecutors or defense counsel. On this day, a file was scheduled for a probation violation hearing. I looked over the file and the client had three years of probation. I found this very odd due to the initial charge possession. Regardless, I thought, another one, because as awful as it may sound, it really was just another one. It wasn't the first PV, and it wouldn't be the last. Even so, I go to the docket call, case is called, I say attorney, we move on. In the same room are POs, their office located floors above the PDs. I go into the holding cell to talk to the client, and a white male, 30 to 35, comes up. I introduce himself, tell him what and who I am, etc. The first words out of his mouth were, $600. I didn't know what that meant or what was going on. 
so I asked him to find out. What I quickly learned was that the client was mentally impaired. He spoke as if he struggled to form sentences that one may consider coherent and intelligent. During our conversation, he kept bringing up the fact that he didn't do anything and that he is paying, paying every month, etc. And probably due to my lack of experience, I kept trying to steer him towards the issue. Why did he violate his probation conditions? It didn't even cross my mind that, hold on, maybe he didn't actually do it. I left the cell and talked with the public defender, told him the situation. Sometime later, after handling a few other cases, as you who do it on a daily basis know, we went to talk to him again. This time, I just watched and listened. Immediately upon introducing himself, $600, I done paid it. Can't shake those words off. Throughout the discussion, the money was being brought up over and over, so I decided to figure out what he meant. I went to the clerks and asked for his information. Now I understood. He had fees of over $2,000 and all he had left to pay was $600. As probably all of you know, you don't pay, you're in violation. Back in the slammer. So in his mind, he thought he was there because he wasn't deemed to have paid. The reality was much worse and much different. After a mini investigation, I found the halfway house or similar to the idea he resided in. I contacted the wonderful old woman who ran it, if you will. She gave me details that this man, although he knew, could not regurgitate and express. Turns out his PO was a scumbag. He had gone to the halfway house, told our client what a piece of crap he was and how he was a waste of DNA. He proceeded to go into the kitchen, sat down, and brought out his service firearm. Then he ordered our client to go into the backyard. Our client did. P.O. told him to dig a grave for himself and told him to use the P.O.'s gun to shoot himself in the head. All of this done in front of the old lady. On the day of the case, I called and she immediately came to testify for him. The judge dismissed the case. Found out later the P.O. was assaulting others and was let go. Never had the chance to meet him face to face. I don't know if this guy read the question properly. Like, it's a great story, very interesting. But why would you regret winning that? Unless I read something wrong, but I don't think I did. Story 16. Little late to the party, but I've still got one I think about a lot. Worked in criminal defense. Represented a guy in a DUI. He had prior, so another conviction meant time, loss of license, problems. Long story short, he was pulled over by police after they followed him leaving a bar. At trial, I elicited admissions from the arresting officer that during the 2.5 miles he followed him for, he did not observe a single moving violation. No speeding, erratic driving, driving over the lines, blowing stop signs, running red lights. Didn't even stop suddenly at red lights. Also got the DRE officer to testify that the accused only spoke Spanish. And they couldn't get an interpreter officer to the roadside to explain the field sobriety exercises. Which the officers documented the accused refused to perform. Jury came back in 15 minutes. Guy was extremely grateful and his lovely family was very gracious in thanking me and our office. Felt really good about the whole thing. Couple months later, I'm in county to meet with a client. And I see him in one of the pods. Find out sometime after the trial, he violently and intimately assaulted his eight-year-old stepdaughter. Think about that one a lot. I know this isn't really related to the whole thing, like, yeah, guy sucks, should be locked up, but I thought field sobriety tests didn't hold any bearing in a court at all. Or do I have that wrong? I'm sure people are gonna let me know in the comments that I'm a, duh, you're an idiot, or something like that. And, you know, you're right, fair enough. I do hope you like the video, though.